And we were talking about the Deuterocanonicals. It's like, it needs to be kind of cutting out. We're talking about the Deuter Deuterocanonicals and um, gave you abundant proof for why they should never have been taken out, because that's what happened. And it's simply anti-historical <clears throat> or a denial of history to claim that the Catholic Church added them in. Certainly not true. Now, um, this next part that I'm going to talk about is really not in your notes. It's just kind of extra knowledge that helps us. So I don't expect you to write any of it down, although you may. Um, this, of course, was notes. What's uh, going to follow now is, is not technically part of your notes. But um, <clears throat> what I wanted to show you is um, I wanted to show you how important the Book of Wisdom is. And the Book of Wisdom is part of that, um, you know, perceived bathwater, which is actually a baby, and it was all thrown out. And as uh, Lent approaches and, you know, Holy Week and all that, you're going to see how much the Book of Wisdom has to do with the Passion of Christ. Now, we already know that Isaiah, uh, the Suffering Servant, Isaiah 53, um, and we know that all Christians <clears throat> have always seen that as a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the suffering servant. But unfortunately, Protestant Christians have um, denied themselves access to the Book of Wisdom, which does the same. See, so I um, used some color to just kind of match things up. So in Wisdom 2, 1, 12, they who said among themselves, thinking not aright, let us lie and wait for the rest. Look how that lines up with Luke 6, 7. The scribes and Pharisees watched him closely to see if he would cure on the Sabbath. So they were setting traps for him. And it's just like Isaiah 53, right? If, if a Protestant says, oh, but how do you know that refers to Jesus? Well, then you can tell them, how do you know that Isaiah 53 refers to Jesus? The ball's right back in their court. Obviously, both refer to Jesus. Um, because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions, he reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. It's basically the words of the Pharisees uh, uttered from the mouth of Solomon. By the way, Wisdom of Solomon is just a synonym or another name for the Book of Wisdom. Uh, let's look at the verse from Matthew down here. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Notice how these words of Christ to the Pharisees are uh, foreshadowed in wisdom. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. It is Moses who accuses you, on whom you set your hope. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. And that kind of matches up with, he reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. This is a sin against their training. He's saying, you guys don't actually believe in Moses as you claim, because if you did, you'd believe in me. So I just want you to notice how much um, the Book of Wisdom lines up with the Gospels. And that is a deuterocanonical book. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts. And in Matthew, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? He judges us debased. He holds aloof from our past as from things impure. He calls blessed the destiny of the just and boasts that God is his Father. For this reason, the Jews tried all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also called God his own father, making himself equal to God. So remember yesterday I was telling you uh, there are things that the New Testament refers to in the Old, and yet those Old Testament references are found in the Deuterocanonicals. This is a great example. Here is an example in a Deuterocanonical where we have someone who's calling God his father. It's unprecedented, and yet it's Jesus himself who then calls God his father. Uh, Mr. Trent. Uh, that's a good question. No, there are not. There are no parts of the New Testament that Protestant Bibles don't have. It's a good question. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to what he says, he will be protected. Look how this matches up almost exactly 
with how they were jeering at Jesus as he hung from the cross. Save yourself if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. You see the parallels, folks? The parallels are too many to ignore, and they're too obvious to ignore. By the way, I'm backtracking a little bit here. I did say this is not your notes and you won't be tested, which is true. But since some people during Holy Week like to meditate on the Passion and Isaiah, why not add wisdom to the mix? I mean, you're going to have time during the Holy Triduum and during Easter break. Uh, so you might as well use it for some extra prayer and scripture reading. And so uh, check out Wisdom 2. So these are all from Wisdom 2. And so just uh, just read all of Wisdom 2, and that's going to help your Holy Week meditation. It's pretty easy to write Wisdom 2. Now, the last uh, little bit on the Deut Deuterocanonicals, and then we're going to move on. And this has nothing to do with the Book of Wisdom. But it's a New Testament quote, part of the Protestant New Testament, because they have the same. And yet, there's nothing else it can refer to besides 2 Maccabees 7. Okay, we all know the story of 2 Maccabees 7, right? You remember how um, the mother witnessed the torture and death of her, of her sons, right? And then the youngest, they were holding out. Let's hope that she can convince them. But no, she actually convinces him to do the opposite. Make me proud, right? Die for the faith. Well, when in the book of Hebrews they talk about the women who received their dead by resurrection right? and talking about their children who were tortured, there is no other Old Testament reference besides 2 Maccabees 7 that I could point to. So, what we're saying is if you throw out the Deuterocanonicals, Hebrews 11 35 just seems to come out of nowhere. Do you see why it's a problem to throw out the Deuterocanonicals? I hope that has become abundantly clear. That's the main thing that should be clear by now. All right. <clears throat> so, as a conclusion to the first part of our Sola Scriptura discussion, we can say that Sola Scriptura is not scriptural, not logical, and not historical. We've seen that it's not scriptural with abundant evidence also not logical. And why is it not logical? Because it defeats itself. It defeats itself. Sola Scriptura is true, it should be in the Bible, but it's not. And not historical, because the Old Testament Jews and the New Testament Christians in the first couple of centuries, actually the first 15 centuries of the Church, all used the Deuterocanonicals, and they all did not believe in Sola Scriptura. It simply wasn't a teaching until the 14th century with Wycliffe and Hus, and then Luther seized on that, right? So it fails on all three counts. Now, what I've given up until now is I've given you evidence against Sola Scriptura. What I'm now going to give is a lot of evidence for our position, which is that Scripture is one of the three pillars, and it's not the only pillar. So what, what we've done up until now is a lot of negative work. Chopping down, chopping down, chopping down. Now we're going to be doing positive work, building up, building up. Okay. Self-defense is always block, punch. Okay. If you just block, well, that's not self-defense. Anyone who knows anything about it. There's got to be a little offense, but only after the defense. And now it's time for some offense. All right, so here's your first offensive weapon. 1 Corinthians 11, 2, 23 to 24. Write the numbers. Don't write the words, but do understand the words, as usual. St. Paul tells them, I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold fast to the traditions, just as I handed them on to you. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread, after he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Now, you could use this as a weapon to defend the Eucharist, but it's also a weapon to defend the Catholic understanding of tradition. And here's what it comes down to. The tradition that's being handed on is the tradition of what was done at the Last Supper for the salvation of these Corinthian Christians. Scripture is not enough. Now, this part of Scripture refers to something that was handed on orally, but we can't just do without the thing that was handed on orally. That's the whole point here. And St. Paul is explicitly referring to the fact that teachings were handed on orally. Back then, most people couldn't even read. And, and, let's keep coming back to this, back then there was no Bible. It's such an important historical point. We should keep coming back to it. There was no Bible. Sola Scriptura was impossible to practice for the first century Christians. Next offensive weapon, 2 Peter 3, 15-17. And consider the patience of our Lord as salvation, as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, also wrote to you, speaking of these things as he does in all his letters. In them, there are some things hard to understand that the ignorant and unstable distort to their own destruction, just as they do the other scriptures. First, I'm going to go back and let you get those numbers down in case you didn't. 2 Peter 3. 15 to 17. And now let's examine why this is such an offensive weapon for tradition and against Sola Scriptura. And that's over here, right? In them, there are some things hard to understand. In other words, not self-interpreting. If as Sola Scriptura says, the Bible is self-interpreting. Don't need any other authority to understand it. Then Paul is wrong here. And you can't have it both ways. You simply can't have it both ways. Not Paul, Peter. Peter is wrong here in what he says about Paul. Why is Peter wrong? Because Peter is saying that some of these things can be twisted since they are not self-interpreting verses. Okay, This is directly opposed to Sola Scriptura. And what it is for is it, it's for the magisterium that helps us to interpret Scripture. The magisterium is an authority, the um, universal and central authority that helps us understand the Bible. Without that, the Bible is not self-interpreting. 2 Peter 1, 20-21. Know this, first of all, that there is no prophecy of Scripture that is a matter of personal interpretation. For no prophecy ever came through human will, but rather human beings moved by the Holy Spirit spoke under the influence of God. Again, this is so explicitly against the self-interpreting idea. He says it, she spells it out. It's not matter of personal interpretation. If it were, there wouldn't be so many thousands of Christian denominations, which unfortunately there are. Because people can't agree on what the right interpretation is. Scripture is not self-interpreting. Peter's very clear about that. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 Paul says, therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. Oral statement, an extremely important reference by St. Paul. A decisively important reference. Why? Because Paul is saying that these oral statements are essential to salvation. You need to stand firm and hold fast to them. 
if Paul believed in sola scriptura, he would not have mentioned oral traditions. It's contrary to it, Mr. Johnson. That's right, which means which means that only scripture is not good enough. Do you know what I'm saying? In other words, if there were a soul and, and scripture were sufficient, as we like to say, then this would be completely superfluous, and he should not even give the option. You see what I mean? And that's the problem, is that he's giving the option. So how does it fail? It fails on two counts. A, an option is given, and B, letter of option does not mean Bible. Because the Bible did not exist. Do you see how problematic the doctrine of Sola Scriptura is, um, Mr. Trent? Are there any letters of Paul that did not make it into the Bible? No. Good question. There are no non canonical letters of St. Paul. Now, if there were, we think. It kind of build on Johnny's question. Paul may have written some letters that were lost, were not included in the Bible, right, because there was only one of them. But none of them were thrown out because they were judged as being contrary to doctrine. Does that make sense, Johnny? Mr. Placencia? No, they did not. But we're going to talk about how they almost threw out James. All right, and that's going to be part of the lesson later today. But yeah, so keep that in mind about James. We'll get to that in a second. The traditions that Paul speaks of are not to be confused with the human traditions. Okay, so it is important. Thing, because I think Jonathan was part of the They're going to bring this person. So I'm going to read. Yeah, 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 I'm going to read.
I put it aside for the temple treasury, so I can't help you guys. That's the kind of stuff they did. And then did they end up donating it all to the temple? No, they probably kept some of it from the temple. Jesus is slapping them in the face for their hypocrisy. But I want you guys to see how these little traditions that he hated have nothing to do with the big T tradition that we're talking about here. And so if a Protestant brings this up, basically are they are confusing the two kinds of tradition. And Jesus himself makes the distinction. 30 to 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. What's the key verse here? Our that whatever is not written in the book is just not important. Are we going to say that, oh yeah, Jesus did some kind of time-wasting things in his life, and some kind of silly things, so you know what, we're not going to include those in the book. No, that's not what they mean. It's just that you can't fit them all in one book. And right here, we have explicit statement and reference to truths that are not written. Very contrary to Sola Scriptura. Very contrary to it. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Can anyone point out Underline what you think is the the key verse here, the key part of the weapon that does damage to the sola scriptura position. Come on up, Olivia. <laughs> okay, go for it. Let's see what you got. Well, that's actually against Sola Scriptura. So, good job underlining that. But who can tell me, <laughs> why would that be against Sola Scriptura, not for it? Mr. Halpin. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. See, it's a reference to hearing, which is not the same as reading. All right. And then why did you understand or underline the other one? What it really is. Yeah. Okay, here's the funny thing. She underlined two good phrases. I'm not 100% on board with her explanations, <laughs> but, but she underlined the right things. So let's talk about them. All right, you can have a seat. Thank you, Olivia. Let's get right in. Okay, so first part, uh, as Jude said, um, you know we're seeing that it's not it's not just writing and reading, but, but what we hear. And say. But the second part is is really really important because what that is is the confirmation that these things that were heard are not just random ordinary speech, but it's actually word of God. And so why why this is important is it's saying that these non-written things that were heard are actually Word of God, and therefore are important. Okay, and do you guys see how it's kind of a one-two punch there? Does that make some sense? Okay. Mark 16, 15 to 16. 
He said to them, Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Repeat the Sola Scriptura position. Mr. Riki. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. So they go out and preach. They tell the gospel. People hear it, believe it, practice it, but they don't read it. And again, the Bible doesn't even exist. All right. So <clears throat> if we're to accept Sola Scriptura, well, then all these people actually were damned. It just says they were saved, but, you know, they can't actually be saved because they weren't Bible readers. They're the, therefore, they're damned. It just doesn't add up. It's a very problematic doctrine. It's amazing that the doctrine can be so strongly held when its foundation is so weak. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, We instruct you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to shun any brother who conducts himself in a disorderly way and not according to the tradition they receive from us. Now, Paul clearly isn't talking here about hand washing before meals and cleaning out the bronze kettles. It's obvious from the context. He's talking about moral behavior. And this moral behavior is something that was passed on by word and example long before it was ever written down. That's what we need. Okay? This is why we need tradition and not scripture. 2 John 12. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink, but I hope to come to see you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Ooh, this is uncomfortable. And it's so uncomfortable for a solar scripture or a Christian. Why, oh Michael, is it so uncomfortable? <laughs> yes, and how is that a problem for Sola Scriptura, Michael? <laughs> exactly, and so he's not only saying here, kind of like our earlier verses, where we were saying, oh yeah, there's writing, but there's also tradition. No, here he's saying, heck with the writing. I just want to talk to you guys. Now, that's not Sola Scriptura talking, if you ask me. All right, so the, the, thing, the thing that we need to remember about the early Christians is that since they didn't have a Bible, and since a lot of them didn't even know how to read and write, you, you, you couldn't base the gospel and, and the, the following of Jesus on, on writing and reading. You just couldn't. It was impractical, impossible. And so, Sola Scriptura simply just doesn't make sense. 3 John 13, I have much to write to you, but I do not wish to write with pen and ink. So notice, he's saying exactly the same thing in 2 John 12 as he is in 3 John 13. that the things he spoke because he preferred not to write them, were those things unnecessary? Were they just frivolous comments? <laughs> yes, Johnny? Oh, I thought, I thought you were going to say something. Excuse me? Yeah, exactly. And actually, you know what? That's a good point too, Johnny. It, it's not... It wouldn't be, it's, it's against common sense to say that every single thing he told these people was about the gospel. I mean, some of it was, hey, how's it going? You know, how are your kids? What's the weather like? Uh, this is really good food. Can you tell me what you're putting in? These were human beings, right? They didn't talk only about the gospel. But the point is that he did have some other important things. And those weren't written. Yes, Michael. What? taking 
all these things in the Bible. And it's like the last thing. So like, like you're taking all these things from the Bible, but you're saying that you can't interpret the Bible. So how can you tell me that you're right if you're the one interpreting it as this? Yes. And then what you can say to them is that I am only using the Bible and interpreting it according to my beliefs to show you that even these Christians who wrote in the Bible didn't only read and write. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, you can't, you can't attack the Bible. Because you can say it. And you can say, look, I don't need the magisterium to tell me everything. The magisterium can interpret everything, but some things that I read are simply just based on what the word says. And John is straight up saying he's not going to write it. Okay, um, Mr. Collins. No, they don't hold that directly. And that's a good question, Seamus. What they hold is that whatever truths people live need to be from the Bible and only from the Bible. So, so that would that would mean that they could have there could be an illiterate Protestant Christian down the street in the megachurch, and they wouldn't say that person's damned because that person's living according to what people who do know the Bible have taught them. Okay, um, Mr. Decker. In that case, I think I would like determine the rules in terms of like, you know, new age, modern, moral, ethical choices, you know, stuff like that, or yeah. clothing, or you know, yeah. stuff like that that wasn't as much a thing from the Bible. That's a great question, Justin. The, the thing is that they, they, they can't really, they can't use Sola Scriptura to justify, you know, some of the, the finer points of bioethics, like cloning and contraception and stuff. And so then, what they're kind of left to their own resources, and they got to come up with what they think is the best thing. And then, is that sola scriptura? No, it's not sola scriptura. And also, they don't agree on those things because some of the Protestant churches say, "Oh yeah, contraception is fine." Others say it's not. Some say, "Oh, um, cloning is fine." Others say it's not. You see, they can't agree because there's nothing in the Bible that directly or explicitly says it. And so they're left to their own resources. Okay. This is another problem with Sola Scriptura. The fact that you don't have tradition and you don't have a magisterium to, to make sure that people are understanding things correctly. So the Protestant churches say their only source of authority is the Bible. But the Bible says the only source of authority is the church which Christ founded. But here's the funny thing. Protestant churches talk about Sola Scriptura. And... The, the problem is Sola Scriptura is not in the Bible. The Catholic Church doesn't talk about Sola Scriptura. The Catholic Church does talk about the authority of Christ given by Jesus to Peter. And that's where the Bible gets its authority from the church that compiled it. See, we don't claim Sola Scriptura. They do. All we're trying to do is show that Sola Scriptura is false. Now, let me clarify. Just because Sola Scriptura is false does not mean the Bible is unimportant. On the contrary, the Bible is extremely important. We should all revere it as much as our Protestant brothers and sisters do. Bible reading should simply be part of your day. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend something to you. It's really easy. Let's say that you want to read a little bit of Bible each day, but you're like, all right, do I do a chapter? Do I do ten minutes? Do I do five minutes? You got to be realistic. So here's a realistic thing to do. You just go to you go to Google. You type in mass readings, and this is what's gonna come up. You get the readings of that day's Mass. And in five minutes, reading them prayerfully, let's say you can't make it to Mass for whatever reason, on a normal busy school day. Well, you take that five minutes, and as you read it, you imagine that God is speaking to you. And it's, it's, it's your time to listen to God speaking to you. And you do it. 
four or five minutes every day, and you're getting some scripture in. Within three years, you will have read almost the entire Bible just by doing that every single day. Okay, so we can be people who love scripture. It doesn't mean we have to spend hours each week reading the Bible. And so what I'm saying is, sola scriptura is false, but the Bible is still extremely important. And we should revere it as such. It's the Word of God. All right, this last thing, um, I don't expect you to write all this down at all. But I want I simply want you to understand the difference between material sufficiency and formal sufficiency. Okay, so material sufficiency, which we accept, is that Scripture contains everything necessary for salvation. Materially sufficient for salvation. It does, it does contain all the truths. However, notice how formal sufficiency is taking it one step further, and that's how the Protestants see Scripture. They claim that Scripture is formally sufficient. All the necessary truths of salvation are spelled out explicitly in the Bible. And that Scripture's meaning is so clear that the Church and tradition are unnecessary for interpreting Scripture. We as Catholics argue against formal sufficiency because of common experience. Different groups disagree. Okay, so all that to just clarify the difference between material and formal sufficiency. A lot of Catholics don't realize that we we um, teach and accept the material sufficiency of Scripture. A lot of Catholics are under the impression that we don't teach. Well, actually, we do. But it's a different way of understanding sufficiency. Does that make sense, guys? The distinction in terms there? Okay. <clears throat> are, are there any other questions or comments that have come up? By the way, did you like my idea of having the occasional um, just talking times where where I tell you one or two days ahead and that's where you kind of bring your comments in? Does that sound like a decent idea to a lot of you? Yeah. All right. So some days we'll have debate um, and then other days, maybe not a whole class period, but we'll have a discussion time. I'll probably start that sometime next week. So I'll give you a heads up of one or two days before so you can kind of prepare it. All right. Next major area, sola fide. So we finished sola scriptura, and now we're moving on to sola fide. And sola fide says that faith alone is the basis of the works that are necessary. All you need to do is believe. In Jesus, and accept him as your personal savior, and you are saved. Amen. All right, this is the essence of sola fide. That the salvation of, Chris, of a Christian consists in that one moment where you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and accept him as your personal savior. Then you're saved. Now, we believe that that's important. We should all do that really every day. I believe in your Lord, I accept you as a personal savior. We can do that every day. But... But that statement doesn't mean you're saved, in our understanding. With sola fide, it does mean you're saved. Okay. Uh, Mr. Trent. Yeah, I guess they would say that if you become an atheist after, afterwards, then you're, you're reversing the statement. Okay, so they would say that. But they wouldn't say, they wouldn't say that okay, let's you make the statement, and then you fall into some kind of serious sin towards the end of your life. Well, they'd say one of two things. They'd say, first, all right, that's not enough, you're still saved. Or they'd say that those bad acts il illustrate that you didn't actually make it. Thus nullifying the original statement. You, you know what I'm saying, Johnny? So they have their ways of getting around it. Is that what? 
Uh, uh, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood it. Wait, I'm not. I'm not hearing everything. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's a fair. It's a fair statement, and that's also the problem with Solafide. Now, in his German translation of the Bible, Martin Luther added the word "alone" to Romans three twenty-eight. For we consider that a person is justified by faith alone, apart from works of law. But he threw it in. Why did he throw it in? Because it fit the idea of sola scriptura, or sorry, sola fide. With the original scripture, it's just fide. He wanted it to be sola fide, and so he threw in the word alone. Now, I want to be very clear that the Protestant Bibles today don't have the word alone in in 328. They don't. Yes, he added it, but there was such an outcry that the addition was was removed. Okay. So don't think he just added it and stayed that way. That's that's simply not true. But but it is true that he tried to add it. <clears throat> he did add it, and then it was it was taken out. And I want to I want us all to understand why he added it, because his reading of Saint Paul was that um, we don't need works; we only need faith. But see, that's not actually what Saint Paul meant. And the reason we know that. If St. Paul had only said, for we consider that a person is justified by faith, apart from works, well, then we could maybe think that what Paul meant was, eh, it doesn't really matter what you do in your life, it's just all about belief. But, of the law, meaning that gets saved, we don't need to do anything the hand washing and the not walking a certain number of steps on the Sabbath. And all of these little rules they had to follow. That's what works of the law means. We don't know that only from Romans 328, but from the entire letter to the Romans that repeatedly talks about how the works of the old law are no longer necessary. So we can't use Romans 328 to throw out acts of charity and good works. St. Paul's entire letter to the Romans refers to works of the law. All these little things. And it does not refer to works in general. So I'm going to read to you from Romans 9, 30 32. It's also in the same letter, but this will help us get a better idea of, of what I'm saying here. What then are we to say? Gentiles who did not strive for righteousness have attained it, that is, righteousness through faith. But Israel, who did strive for the righteousness that is based on the law, did not succeed in fulfilling that law. Why not? Because they did not strive for it on the basis of faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. So Paul here is saying, He's saying that their error was that they thought salvation consisted in just following the rule book. And so their version of salvation was, let's do works of law, and let's forget about faith and charity and all that other stuff. Let's just check things off the box. See, that's a problem. That's what Paul is talking about in that last thing I read. You. Romans 10, 9-10. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. <laughs> Romans 9, or Romans 10, 9 through 10, is often used as a defense of sola fide. But that's because people don't know history. They would know exactly what 
Paul meant and what his readers understood. Back in those days, to confess something with your mouth was basically to sign your own death warrant. Because someone would tell on you for being a Christian and eventually you get found out. So you could say that Paul is essentially saying here that you need to believe, yes, but you also need to proclaim it. And if you proclaim it, you're going to suffer. Now, that's not faith alone, folks. That's a lot more than faith. It's failing it publicly and suffering the consequences. Paul was calling them here to a heroic witness. And that's why many of them spoke so much. Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. The one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this saying. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to the neighbor, hence love is the fulfillment of the law. He says, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the key to salvation. He does not say that faith is the key to salvation. Now, naturally, you can't love unless you have a certain foundation of faith, right? But, but if faith were the main thing, then Paul would have said so. But faith is not the main thing. Faith is a necessary condition for the main thing, which is love. So faith alone doesn't work on that count. If anything, you could say charity alone. But charity alone includes so many other things, whereas faith alone doesn't include everything else. You can believe in God and be a rotten, nasty person. Even, even the, the, the demons believe in God, right? They don't have the beatific vision. They don't witness him directly. But demons know God exists. They're dirty, rotten scoundrels. It's the point then. The point then is that faith can't be enough. Faith can't be a guarantee of salvation. All right, folks, I think that's enough for today. I want to thank you guys for something. You guys are a great class. You really are. I don't tell this to you enough, but I like all the questions, the attention, uh, the great spirit you show as a class. So, so you guys are awesome. Keep up the good work. All right, have a good day.